Hello again, Flame community. My name is Jeff Kyle, and I'm back here on Logic Academy. Randy and Andy over at Logic.tv are dishing out content left and right, and as it turns out, part of that involves inviting me back with another exciting tutorial. This time around, I'll be covering something called the Image Node. I wouldn't say it's a very new feature since it came out in Flame 2019, but it is very unique compared to most of the other features in Flame. But because of this, some Flame artists may have never checked it out. So my goal with this tutorial is to, if you aren't so familiar with it, get you up to speed on how the image node works, how I use it, and what I use it for. Traditionally, in the finishing world, timeline effects can only take you so far, and as soon as something a little bigger comes up, you have to escalate that shot to batch effects or batch in order to get the job done. But in some cases, depending on the task, of course, you can do a lot more than you might think right in the timeline by taking advantage of the image node. I'm working in Flame 2022.1, but most of what I'm covering spans several years of versions, so it should be relatively universal. As to the structure of this tutorial, it's going to be split up into two videos. The first video here, we're going to start by talking a little bit about how the image node works, its interface, its structure, how you go about using it in general. Then in the second video, we'll focus on some of the specifics, first looking at what it looks like to do some beauty work, then what it looks like to do some color grading, and we'll end with some miscellaneous things that I think are definitely worth mentioning. Before we move on, a big shout out and thank you to Autodesk for sponsoring this video. And now let's jump right in. You can find the image node in a few places. In batch, it's just another node here in the bin. And in the timeline, it comes in two flavors, green and regular. If you're unfamiliar with this concept, when a timeline effects node is green, I've heard it described as a source node, so in this case, a source image node, it means it takes place before any other timeline effects are applied. So if you use the image node here, it would be applied before any resize, time warp, or other timeline effects nodes you have on the clip. But regardless of the image node that you choose, once you dive into it, they are all the same. Under the hood, the image node is based on and built on the action node. It has a schematic like action that you can access the same way you do normally, flame hotkey tilde. You can add gmask tracers just like you do in action, either through a hotkey or by pulling it out of the bin and you can add matchboxes in a similar way. Really, if you're familiar with action, there will be a lot of things you'll recognize here in the image node. There are a few little effects tab default settings that I'd like to just breeze through really quick before we get too far. The first order business is the time bar here. I know it could help to view the full sequence's timeline sometimes, and it's good to have options, but my opinion is that it's usually more useful to focus on the shot in question. So I like to switch this option setting to media range right here, and now it'll show us the shot in blue and any handles in gray. I think this is the way to go while you're working on a single shot, but you can always pretty easily switch between them. I also like to make sure this panel mode is set to dual instead of single. Maybe I'm just used to dual mode since that's how the image node started out, but I do like having access to the keying and matchbox settings at one time, but we'll go into more detail about that later. With that out of the way, by default, the image node starts you off with the basic selective setup in place. If you've used selectives before, this setup will be familiar, but if you haven't, then let's talk about it. If we take a look at the image schematic with tilde again, there's this surface here that everything is connected to. You never actually do anything to it when you're working with selectives, but it has to be there in order for everything to work. So you just have to get in the habit of seeing it, but not really worrying about it. In the image node, as opposed to the action node, there isn't really any multi-layer compositing going on. So you can't really have multiple surfaces. So in every image node you work with, it'll always be this structure of having one singular surface and everything else connected to it. Beneath that main surface is something called primary and selective one. The key to understanding selectives lies in their name. A selective selects part of your image, isolating it so you can do something to it. If we click on the selective to open up its object settings, we can see that we're able to isolate the image a couple of different ways through traditional keying using the diamond keyer, through some G-mask tracer keying, which is just a different type of keyer. And finally, there's some machine learning based isolations through the semantic keyer. We can also connect the G-mask tracer right onto the selective to further isolate the result of your key or if you haven't yet keyed anything, you can just use the GMAX tracer to isolate your image by itself. Each of these methods isolates or selects part of the image, allowing us to do whatever it is we'd like to do next. A very important little detail to note about keying in this selective environment is that the basis for your keying, or in other words, what your selective's keyer is looking at to do its keying math, is not just the original source of your image node. It's actually looking at the result of that primary layer, 
The use case for this feature has to do with making sure the image is balanced before any keying takes place to ensure you have enough color separation to maximize the effectiveness of your keying. As long as you know how this works and you understand that it exists, you'll know to either leave the primary layer alone if it doesn't need any adjustment or to intentionally adjust it to help with your keying down the road. Once you have a selection with some kind of key or mask, now when you modify the image with a matchbox shader, it only affects the part of the image that's been isolated by the selective. By default, the image node comes hooked up to master grade matchbox nodes, which are the go-to nodes for color grading. With the dual view selected, which we just changed, you have access to both the keying parameters from the selective you selected and whatever matchbox you have selected. In this case, it's the master grade matchbox. Once you've pushed your selective as far as it can go, you've keyed it, refined the selection with the G-mask, and done some kind of color grade, and now you'd like to work on a different part of the image, then it's time to add another selective. Just to quickly illustrate a point, let's say you weren't using the image node, for instance, if you were doing this same kind of operation just in batch, and you wanted to start working on another part of the image. It would involve going to the bin, dragging out a new node or series of nodes, and hooking everything up appropriately. With the image node and the selective workflow, that whole operation is one click away right down here in this little grid of numbers in the bottom left corner of the screen. One is selected to start you off, but there's two through eight and pages that go all the way up to 48. When you click on an unused selective, Flame automatically creates everything you need to get started again. If we head over to the schematic, again with tilde, you can see what's happened. Whereas previously there was only selective one, we can see now that selective two has been created and just like before, it's hooked up to that original surface and has the master grade attached to it. Now, you can do exactly what we did before with selective one, but maybe with a different part of the image. Just as a note, if you alt click on a number down here in the grid, it deletes the selective and any attached matchboxes or G masks. As to how we're modifying the image, the default is the master grade matchbox shader, but it's definitely not the only node that you can use. The quickest way to choose the matchbox that you use for a selective is to space click on an unselected selective number, presenting you with a nice list of matchbox shaders to choose from. Another way to change your selective if you don't remember the keyboard shortcut is to select the selective you want to change and head over to the shader tab and select change shader. And then we have our nice list of matchbox shaders again. The last method, and it's almost not even worth mentioning with these other two methods available, is to head to the schematic and with the selective selected, you can just drag out the shader you want from the bin and remove the old one. But while we're here, let's talk about having multiple matchbox shaders on a single selective. Same as before, you can space click on an already used selective to add a selective to it. Another way to do this, as you saw a minute ago, is in the schematic. You can just pull out a new matchbox shader with a selective already selected. And the last way to add a selective is to go back to the main image node menu and use this plus icon right here when you have a selective selected. That gives you the big list again and you can choose your selective. To keep track of them, you can either flip back to the schematic to see what matchboxes you've added, or take a look at this little bar here. This is going to list everything associated with your currently selected selective, and allow you to click on the different tabs to switch between the different objects connected to the selective. That includes matchbox shaders or G-masks. The only catch here is that if you have a selective that has a ton of G-masks and matchbox shaders, the list really only has a small amount of space to fit everything in. You might find yourself scrolling through that list to select what you want. In practice, I've really only found a use for two matchbox shaders at a time, usually some kind of effect like A2 Beauty in conjunction with a master grade color correction. But the beauty of the image selective workflow is that it's really up to you. If you can find a use for five matchboxes hooked up to a single selective, more power to you. The next thing we'll talk about are a few other things I'll call image node workflow enhancers. The first of which being something called the manager. You can pull up the manager by first setting a two up view with Alt 2. And then after you click on that newly created screen, just press eight with the flame hotkeys, or through this drop down here and select manager. The manager lists everything going on in your image node, listing selectives and their corresponding matchboxes and G masks, and gives you a nice little thumbnail that's representative of the selection that you've made with the selective. It's definitely a more organized way to show what's going on, especially with a particularly busy shot. If I remember my flame release history correctly, I'm pretty sure the whole reason the manager came about was to add some accessibility and visibility for people who are not as familiar with some of the ins and outs of the image node. The Explorer is this window on the right that's up by default, but you can get there from the Flame Hotkey Meta Escape, or you can click the bottom right flame icon and click Show Explorer. This tab holds two things, Timeline Effects and Grabbed References. 
The Timeline Effects tab is where you store snapshots of a single selective, a series of selectives, or a whole image node, which helps tremendously if you're doing some look development and you want to save several looks, compare a few different versions of something, or just save your work to test something out without having to back out and save your work either in the library or duplicating your timeline. The only caveat here is that this is an effects tab only feature. If you're using the image node in batch, then you aren't able to save selectives or nodes like this, but I think that makes sense. I think that kind of look development is better suited in the effects tab anyway. And finally, the other tab is the grabbed references tab, and that's just where any of your grabbed references go. Quick glimpse at that, it's control G to grab a reference of whatever you have up on your screen, and then you can use the compare modes, which is this drop down here, to compare it to your current shot. I'll choose angle split, and if it doesn't come up by default, you have to select what you want to compare it to. In this case, we want to compare it to the reference we just grabbed. So it's this drop down right next to the compare mode drop down, and I'll choose grab references, and then the reference I just grabbed. A very useful feature if you need it. And I can't just mention the grab references without just ever so briefly mentioning some not so apparent navigation stuff. So we know that you can hold down space to pan around the screen, of course, and control space to zoom into your screen. But for grab references, it's space shift to pan around your grab reference and space shift control to zoom that grab reference in. And to reset, it's just this drop down here and reset reference settings. Just couldn't walk away from that without making sure you know that one because I find myself comparing stuff in the image node all the time. Another key part of the image node we haven't touched yet is the HUD. You've probably seen it as we've gone through some of the other overview features. It's this guy at the top left of the screen. It's a great visual way to switch between your selectives and to keep track of them. And the bonus here is that if you rename your selectives and stay organized that way, you can see those names in the HUD. If you've watched some of the older tutorials on the image node, you might have noticed that where you go to name these selectives has changed over the years. You used to rename them in the Controls tab, but for now, renaming a selective takes place right here in the Object menu. The only thing to keep in mind is that it's context sensitive. You just have to be sure that you're selecting the right selective. Once it's named, it'll appear up here in the HUD. Now, I know for those of you who aren't really into that level of organization, you might think to yourself, uh, maybe I'll pass on renaming. And that's fair. You're allowed to be just as organized as you want to be or need to be. But I have for you a very good reason to consider naming your selectives, and it's a convenient segue into our next topic. And that is the multi-shot workflow, or sending the image node or selectives from one shot to another. Again, this is an effects tab specific workflow. You can't do this in batch because it deals with working on multiple shots at once, but there are a few things to know when sending selectives from one shot to another. The first thing that I think is worth mentioning is that selecting shots is a little different than it is elsewhere in Flame. I'll just bring up another window here that we haven't talked about. Instead of the manager here on the left, I'm gonna swap that for something called the storyboard. It's Flame Hotkeys Shift F1, or just right here in the dropdown. It's pretty much the same as this ribbon here in the middle of the screen, but it's a little more flexible in that it's scalable and a little more customizable. But what I want to do quickly is show you how selections work. When you select a shot, it gets the nice familiar yellow box around it, signifying that it is selected, just like you do pretty much everywhere in Flame. What's different is when you multi-select with control click or when you shift click a range of clips, you'll notice an orange box around the other clips you've selected, signifying that it is selected, but not the main focus. When you click on the other clips in the selection, it doesn't deselect the other clips, it just changes the focus. Once you have a selection, you can just drag the whole image node from one shot to whatever you have selected, and that sends the image node and all of its selectives, G-masks, and keys to the other shot or shots. In this case here, after I dragged it over, all of those shots have the same image node now. They're all identical. Alternatively, you can send over a single selective or a selection of selectives via control click, and drag them over to your selection to send just those selectives and not the whole image node. Take a look. Just selectives 1 and 2 came over when I dragged that over, but not 3 and 4 because I didn't select those. But depending on the selectives you already have on the destination node, a few things can happen when you drag the selectives like this. If there's no image node on the destination clip, then it'll just send the chosen selectives over just as you would expect. If there's already an image node there, and the selective numbers you've chosen to drag over don't exist on the destination image node, then they'll get added into the empty space. So here's a little example where I send selectives 4 and 5 over, and 1 and 2 are already in use, but 4 and 5 weren't. So they were just added just fine. Now, if you're dragging selective numbers that do exist on your destination image node, then that's where you have to start making some decisions. If you drag them over and there are conflicts, you're presented with a dialog box that gives you your options. The options are pretty clear here on the screen, but just to talk it out, you can append the selectives to the next available selective number. You can replace just the selective, which replaces things like the key and the G masks, but leaves the matchbox alone. You can replace just the matchbox shader, but leave the keys and G masks alone. 
or finally the default option which is to replace the destination image node selectives with selectives you've dragged over. If you're a fan of keyboard shortcuts, holding down control while you drag a selective chooses the append option for you so you don't have to choose, and holding down shift chooses the replace option. Otherwise the dialog box is my go-to because I think personally I mix the keyboard shortcut modifiers up too often so I like relying on choosing the dialog box option instead of just remembering which modifier does what. But that's just me. But with this workflow in mind, if you're sending selectives over from shot to shot, obviously it depends on the circumstances. But I've found more times than not, it sure helps to have named your selectives so you can keep track of what everything is doing without digging into the schematic or trying to remember which number was which. One other thing to keep in mind here while we still have the storyboard up is that if you're going to be working with a ton of shots and you'll need to be sending the image node across multiple similar shots, sometimes I'll reorder the clips so that similar shots are grouped together and it's a lot easier to apply an effect to shots that are next to each other as opposed to hunting them down one by one. The best part about this workflow is that reordering them in the storyboard doesn't alter their order in the timeline, it's just a visual organization. The way you do this is by selecting all of your shots or just the ones you want to group and then click this little plus icon here. That gives you a window to create a new group with your current selection. Your new group gets added to this little drop down box here and with it selected you can select the filter button and then the custom order button. Now you can just drag shots around in whatever order makes it easier for you to work. This is a great long form workflow that saves you a ton of time and hassle but it definitely isn't necessary all the time for every type of job. And the last subject on the agenda for this video is the scopes window. This is definitely geared more toward color grading than beauty or effects, but in my mind it's enough of an overview subject I think it's worth mentioning here. When I'm grading, I like having the information that the scopes provide about the image, and I'm used to using them to help explain what I'm looking at on the screen. Since we still have the storyboard up, let's use a 3-up view with Alt-3, click on the newly created screen, and click this button here to turn that window into your scopes window. This is what it looks like by default, but I like to go into the settings and change a few things around. In this first presets window, I set the layout to 3-up and grid. Then in this presets widgets window, I set this left one, which is the top, to waveform video and then RGB parade. Waveform video again on this next one, but then luminance mono instead. And then on this last one, I set it to vector scope video. In my mind, that gives me everything I need when I'm working on a grade. Having that separation for your red, green, and blue at the top here gives a ton of information, but it's also great to have that consolidated mono view of the waveform to be able to gauge overall luminance. And the vector scope's ability to check saturation levels, skin tone ranges, and overall color balance is very useful. Just one more thing about scopes that you might not be so familiar with. Of course, they work how you might expect when modifying the image, but when you're using a compare mode, the scopes of the image you're comparing get overlaid on top of your scopes for the image you're looking at, so you can easily see how they compare from a technical standpoint and adjust accordingly if you're trying to match them. And that's everything that I think is worth mentioning, overview-wise, about the image node. Hopefully you learned a few things here about how it works in general, but if you're looking for some real-world examples of how it's used and how I use it in my day-to-day, -day, stay tuned for part two, where we go over some beauty workflows, some color grading workflows, and a few extra tips to tie everything together. If you have any questions or comments, you can find me on the forums at forum.logic.tv, and I'm more than happy to help. Otherwise, my name is Jeff Kyle. Thank you very much for watching Logic Academy, and I'll see you next time.